Hello and welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic. Now something special today, um, as Simon's told you in the last video about Elgin's fantastic puzzle, Symphony Bethetique, um, there was a Playfair uh, code within that and we're going to look at how to solve a Playfair code today. So. Um, first of all, what is a Playfair cipher? Well, it's something I came across um, in my early days of solving AZ crosswords, where once or twice a year, a puzzle would have a number of entries where you had to solve the clue and then encode it into the grid using a Playfair cipher. And you had to discover the Playfair key as well. Now. I assumed at the time that this was a puzzle invented for crosswords, uh, a, a code invented for crosswords, but it turned, I'd never heard, and, and this was before the internet, I'd never heard of um, a real life Playfair code or its use, but it turns out that it's a genuine thing that was invented in the 1850s by a friend of Lord Playfair. I was very surprised to find that was a real name. Um, and this guy, Charles Wheatstone, invented this code to kind of work on the fact that um, ordinary substitution ciphers, you could use letter frequency to get at them, whereas this one codes pairs. And let's have a look at the rules. Um, almost every time you see a crossword with a Playfair code, it'll explain how a Playfair square works. So, to encode a word, that word is split into pairs of letters. So, Mozart, you split into M O Z A R T. When a pair forms the opposite corners of a rectangle within the square, the other two corner letters are the coded form. So, here, M O, you use the other two um, corners of the rectangle as the output of the code. So, M O becomes P J. Um, and as it says in the instructions, they're always phrased this way, not JP, which OM gives. Now, for the first large number of Playfair puzzles that I did, three or four of them, I didn't honestly know whether that was because you always took the row equivalents first or because you took the nearer of the two first. And it turns out that you always take the row equivalents first. So MO here gives PJ because P is on the same row as M and J is on the same row as O. Um, so again, with ZA, they're on the corners of a rectangle, so they give VN, the other corners. Um, now, obviously, letters, the pair of letters could appear in the same row or column. Um, and there's a special rule for that. When they do, you take the next letter after each one in the row. And if you get to the end of the row, you start again at the beginning. So RT becomes TM here because they're in the same row. So the letter after R is T and the letter after T is M. If you'd had RP, you'd get TQ. Um, this is reasonably important. And also, by the way, if you're wondering what happens with the last letter in an odd length word or phrase, or what happens when you have a double letter and it's the same letter, well, crossword convention is you avoid that happening. So that's not going to happen for us. Um, so that's how it works. And I mean, at first sight, that's quite a clever code because there's no way to get a handle on the frequencies of letters. Um, JQ will, I mean, MO will code to something totally different from MU. Um, there won't be, or ME, sorry, MO would goes to PJ, but ME goes to RA. So there's kind of no similarity there to get hold of. So you can see why that was originally considered a pretty difficult code to crack. Now, why that became so popular in crosswords, I don't know. The standard form of an AZ was to give you five or six, about six words that were Playfair encoded, and you'd have to use the letters you got in the grid to um, 
work out what the code was and the, the original code word. So let's have a look at the, the clues from the Elgin crossword that were in italics. You knew that these were going to have to be Playfair encoded in the grid. Music maker for Scottish region, a new quartet come back for this instrument. Old boy and grandchild get music from this and rely on this instrument. Well, none of these are easy. I mean, it was a hard puzzle, but if you know certain words that crop up regularly from the kind of depths of chambers, but that get used in crosswords, there is a way to get a bit of a handle on this. So old boy, that's often OB, that's an official abbreviation in chambers, and grandchild, and that can be OE. So let me just show that to you in chambers. Um, this bizarre word, very useful for Scrabble players, oi, oi, or oi, and it's pronounced oi or o or oi, is Gaelic Scottish for a grandchild. So you've got ob and oe, so that answer is clearly oboe. Get music from this is the definition. Well, that's fair enough. And now, if you start thinking about... Um, musical instruments, well, this one becomes possible because one of the Scottish, re Scottish regions traditionally is called Fife, and of course that's a musical instrument. So now we've got two four-letter musical instruments. Down here, rely on this instrument. Well, that's what well, that clue itself relies on is a quite odd part of the definition of the word on. So here, I can't quite highlight the right bit, but one of the one of the definitions of on is on the way to being drunk slang. And if you had drunk, that would be clearly an anagram indicator. So some setters, particularly hard ones, have used on as an anagram indicator just on its own. I think that's a bit frowned on these days. I mean, it's so unnatural for on to have that meaning in a clue and to mean that, that that's not popular. But if you allow it for this puzzle, and it was a very hard puzzle, so it's a possible thing, um, then you know you're looking for an anagram of rely. This instrument is a lyre. So we're seeing four-letter musical instruments. This one's a bit more obscure, but the word plays reasonably easy. A, new, that can be N, quartet, come back for this instrument. Well, this time for the quartet, you need the Roman for four. And if you write A-N-I-V backwards, you get Vena, which I think, I'm not going to claim I knew this, but it is an Indian stringed instrument. So there we go. So these are the four answers, Fife, Vena, Oboe, and Lyre. And the grid had those here. So Fife becomes A-B-D-M. Uh, Vena becomes H-A-L-D. Um, oboe becomes something O-C something, and we don't know what those letters are. So that's going to be a bit of an obstacle in the code. And Lyre becomes P-V-W-T. So first of all, let's just write those here. So F-I-F-E becomes A-B-D-M. O-B-O-E becomes something O-C something, V-I-N-A becomes H-A-L-D, and L-Y-R-E becomes V-V-W-C. It might be more useful to write them separately as the, as the eight pairings we have. And then the thing to do is to start playing around with squares. Now, um, what do we have? We, we know, let's just go back to the rules for a while. It's quite important to remember, as with a lot of code breaking, a lot of it is based on probability, what is likely. Now, because the opposite corners of a rectangle is one of the ways of getting this, in fact, that's going to happen, I think it's 64% of the time, if the letters are assumed to be equal, that most pairs that you get are going to be rectangle pairs. Now, from a setting point of view, from coding point of view, there are three types of relationship. There's the rectangles, the ones in the same row, and the ones in the same column. From a solving point of view, I think there are five types. There are the rectangles. Again, that's most of them. But there are also ones in the same row with consecutive letters, 
And they're very helpful. This RT giving TM, that's much more helpful than if you had had RP. And the reason for that is because this is the only thing that gives you a clue about which column comes in which order. So if you know that RT gives TM, you know that there's a sequence of RTM in some row or column. And that's really helpful. Not only does RT becoming TM tell you that it's a row or column pair, it also tells you the order that they appear in that row or column. Um, so they're very helpful. Less helpful would be an RP where they're detached in a row or column. Um, and in fact, the least helpful of all are column ones because I'll show you. For every other type of um, pair, you know that the second letter in the pair is in the same row as the second letter in the output. So M O, O is on the same row as the J in PJ, and also in RT, M. T is in the same row as M. So for all of the ones that are in a rectangle or the same row, that works. The only ones it doesn't work for, say we had HE as a pair, that would give EG. And in that case, E from the first pair and G from the second are not in the same row. Um, but if they're not in the same row, they must be one above the other. So the relations between the second letter and the pair, the same actually works for the first letter, um, are very important, possibly more important than the actual pairs. So let us go back to the pairs that we have. Oh, no, sorry. The other thing, just before we go away, is to remember that the letters at the top of this grid are kind of random. You just don't know what they're going to be until you start getting a handle on the phrase, and then it's a kind of hangman or wheel of fortune game. But at the bottom, you're going to have the rest of the letters of the alphabet in alphabetical order. So here they start from C, C, F, G, K, M, P, Q, R, T, B, W, X, Y, Z. And they're probably going to include the least used letters. So the bottom row of the grid almost always has five letters from the T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z set. Not always, but most times that happens. So that's really worth remembering. Z is quite likely to be the bottom right letter and so on, and that X and Z are probably going to be in the same pair and so on. So let's go back to the pairs that we've got for this puzzle. We've got, here they are down here, um, FI becomes AB, OB becomes something O, now that's good, that tells us that O and B are in the same row or column, possibly row. FE becomes DM, OE becomes C something. They're not very helpful. Although note that the F is the same in the first and the third pairs there. VI becomes HA. LY becomes PV. Now that's quite interesting. Y and V are two of those letters that are quite likely to be on the bottom row. And here they are, both the second in their pairs. So let's just start guessing that we can sketch in L. Y, P, V. Now I'm just guessing how far they are apart. That might be right, it might be wrong. If they were that far apart, that would be because W, X were coming in between them down there. So that's possible. And that's quite plausible because you can easily imagine L and P on the same row in the remainder of the alphabet. In fact, they'd probably be on the row directly above V and Y with either MN there or, and NO there and W there and X there. That's very possible. So that's quite a pleasing and possible start to this. Now, it's quite unlikely the compiler will have deliberately given you misleading pairs, although, you know, let's not put anything past the wit of compilers, but there we go. Now, here's an interesting one, then. If we assume that this is, is a decent start, um, we've got RE becomes WT. And we were thinking that W was going to have to be on the bottom row, although we don't know how many there are between these two. But let's say W comes after the V. 
Now, R would have to be somewhere above. It can't come before. Oh, no, sorry. What I mean is R is probably then on the bottom row as well because it's the first in the pair. And then we would have an E above and a T above. So RE would give WT. So that's quite possible. And now we just need either an X here or a Z here, one of those possibilities. So it's plausible. We might have to unwind this and try again. We don't know. Now let's have a look at this one. NA becomes LD, and we've got an L put in. But how's this going to work? N becomes L. Well, N could be on the same row. And then we could have A there and D there. That's quite possible. Again, there are other possibilities. N could be directly over the L and A directly over the D. But let's carry on with this possibility. Now that DN might need to be here instead. Don't know, but that's certainly possible. Now we've got VI equals HA. Now we've put V and A in the same column, so that's quite plausible. V becoming R, V becoming H and I becoming A. That would work. V would become H, I would become A. So now I think we've got a setup that would work for all these four. So let's have a look at some of these others. F becomes D and E becomes M. Well, we've got E and D written here, so F would have to be here. Oh no, this doesn't work. Okay, D has to be... Right, we said DN could be there, and they are. Let's put F on the same row. F becomes D, and E becomes M. So M is on the same row. Could be here or in the other one. Okay. Ooh. Sorry, don't know why... Uh, just a full size F. So M becomes, a, oh, that's possible. Now FI becomes AB, and that's wrong. That's not working. So FI becomes AB. So what's gone wrong there? R, well, that from the RE becomes WT. Maybe we need to move the T and E up to the top. And look, that's giving us a beginning to the key phrase of the. That's quite entertaining. Now, the M has to move up with the E as well for the FE becomes DM. Um, now, FI becomes a B. And that puts a B there. Um, sorry, let's just make that size. Okay. So now OB becomes something O. So O becomes something and B becomes O and they have to be, O has to follow B either in a row or column. So must follow it there. And O becomes something. Well, we don't know what that is. And then finally, the only one we haven't really looked at is OE becomes C something. So that would put a C here. Um, sorry, let's just correct those. Okay, so this is possible. This is working, I think. So we have an X here. Oh no, we've got a blank between N and P. So what can we fix? Ah, oh, that original LY becomes PV we could move P and Y to those two cells instead. And I think everything still works. RE becomes WT, NA becomes LD, LY becomes PV, VI becomes HA in the same column, OE becomes C something, FE becomes DM, FI becomes AB, and OB becomes something O. This all works. 
So now we can finish off what, what's in the rest of the alphabet. It must be a Z at the end. Q between the P and the R. Now between F and L, we've already used I and H. And I does duty for I and J. That's quite an important feature of these Playfair squares. So we can fill in G and K. We've got U, X and S to use. So U goes there. Um, because we have to make a phrase of the beginning of this. And that phrase now clearly has to be the music box, which is the um, obviously the name of the Laurel and Hardy film, which was so brilliantly commemorated by this puzzle. Um, and we've cracked this Playfair word square. Now, if we'd gone wrong at various points, we could have started again. Um, we could have rubbed it out and tried again. Sometimes you have to go through assuming that something is a row pair and something is a column pair and then try it again the other way. Sometimes you, I've even solved a play fair without a row or column pair. That's much harder because the rows can move anywhere, the columns can move anywhere. You kind of need the alphabetical order thing to work. Quite important always to notice whether the instructions tell you that you're looking for a phrase like the music box or a word or sometimes they have no repeated letters they're quite popular with compilers for creating these phrases like the music box sometimes any repeated letters are ignored which is a slightly different sort of diagram um, like in the Playfair example on Wikipedia they use Playfair example as the phrase and they just take P-L-A-Y-F and then the A gets left out, I-R-E-X-M, leaving out the letters in example that are repeated. So that's how it works and that's how to solve one. Now, if you want to do some homework on this, you could try and work out what the original Playfair word square was in the instructions because I didn't have that. As I said, um, this was the original preamble for the puzzle. It said, it gave the example of Mozart becoming PJVNTN. And I've created this Playfair word square that works, but it uses Joshua Blend as the key phrase, and that's probably not right, because that doesn't really mean anything. So uh, if you can work out what the real key phrase from that Playfair square was, brilliant. But with only three pairs to work on, it's extremely hard to know exactly how the Playfair square should fall out. You probably need to make a good guess at the key phrase at some point to get that. But I hope that's been helpful. That's, that's how I would go about solving a Playfair square. And that's how this puzzle, and um, what a puzzle it was, gave the music box as the uh, phrase for its, the key phrase for its Playfair square. Thanks very much for watching. And I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Hope to see you again on Cracking the Cryptic. Bye for now.